I knew a few months ago that I was going to be speaking this morning, and I started preparing my message not knowing that I was still going to be in the food series, which we've been talking about rib cook-offs, tri-tip cook-offs. It's amazing you guys just don't go out of this service after hearing messages on food and commit the sin of gluttony. <laughs> but I guarantee you that's not our reasoning behind teaching on food. But because we've had so many messages and so many good messages, how, how food and fellowship are just inexorably linked in the Word of God, how they are connected and, and how there is a community of fellowship around those items and those things and, and have just been so communicated so well. But man, I'm quite a ways down the line in this food series, so I've decided to affectionately title my message, The Leftovers. <laughs> okay? So we're going we're gonna to get into this, and we're going to go to Daniel chapter 1, because uh, as I had been preparing my message, uh, Pastor Ryan encouraged me uh, to, to hit Daniel uh, the book of Daniel and just introduce it into the thought process and it really works well with where we're going. So we're going to start in Daniel. We're going to talk about Daniel's time, then we're going to go to Peter and talk about what it was like for Christians under the, 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 the uh, rule of Nero, whereas in Daniel's time it was Nebuchadnezzar. And then we're going to talk about our generation now and how what we are living now is applicable to what we saw back then. Okay, so as we go to Daniel, uh, let's just read this, these passages together. Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. This was the cream of the crop. These were the most eligible bachelors. These were the best-looking guys. These were the guys that you mom wanted your daughters to bring home for a meal. And the king, in his earthly, carnal mindset, was looking for these types of people. So he brings them in, and here's what he wants to do. He wants to teach them in the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. We'll get into that a little bit later. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that, they ate, the, that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among those were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And then this is interesting, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. That's an interesting statement. Now, apart from the obvious that that food in the king's palace was sacrificed to idols and Daniel saw a very spiritual significance to partaking of that food and he didn't want to do it. He had personal convictions, too, about that. But it's interesting to me that this people who came, they had been dispersed into Babylon. They were in exile. They were slaves amongst people. They were being persecuted and beaten uh, for their faith. And something that could have been a life or death situation for Daniel because from the king's point of view he's been brought into the king's court he's been offered the best and we all know Neb was a pretty crazy dude right he was one crazy dude influenced by satanic forces I mean this is the king who went in to Judah killed the king's kids while the king sat there, the king of, his, uh, of Judah, and killed the king's kids while the king sat there and watched, and then he plucked the king's eyes out so it would be the last thing he ever saw. This guy was crazy. Led by satanic influences. And so for Daniel to stand up and defy the king this way could have been a death sentence for Daniel, but he did it anyway. Because there was a lot more significance to that. 
It was part of a bigger picture. And we see in that big picture three things that the king tried to do to these children of Israel, these children that God loved. And in that big picture, one commentary says the purpose of the food, the changing of their names, and the education was simple. It was an effort at total indoctrination, the goal of making these Jewish men leave behind their Hebrew God and culture. So the king does three things. Number one, he gives all of these Hebrew children new names. For, so for Daniel, his name meant God is my judge. The king changes it to Belteshazzar, meaning Baal's prince. Baal was one of the primary gods they worshipped at that time. Hananiah's name meant beloved by the Lord. He gave him Shadrach, illumined by the sun god. Mishael, meaning who is as God, he gave Meshach, who is like the god Venus. And Azra, meaning the Lord is my help, gave him the name Abednego, meaning servant of the god Nego, the god of wisdom of that day. So the first thing t- the king does is he gives them a new identity. He's trying to change the way they see themselves. The second thing the king does, Nebuchadnezzar also took them from their people and they lived and dined in the king's food court. Think about that. They're taken from their families and their communities and they're placed into a new community. And there they're expected to sit and dine on the seductive delicacies of the king and start to generate around a banquet, a new community, a new family. Now, by Eastern standards, Baldwin, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury, said by Eastern standards to share a meal was to commit oneself to friendship that was of covenant significance. So Daniel saw this as more than, hey, this is a a casual gathering. We're all hanging out and eating. This was an attempt by the king to do the second thing, give them a new community, a new family. And then the third thing that the king did, he wanted them to be taught in the way of the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans were a bunch of satanic worshipers that were astrologers, witchcraft, soothsayers, and the king's idea was to indoctrinate them for three years and have them sit in the training to change the way they think. And I find it interesting that probably the most satanic leader of that generation, led by evil forces, chose to attack not only their identity and their community, but through this indoctrination, he attempted to give them a new mission. Now, if we stop and think here for a minute, we walk through that lobby every Sunday, and we see the conviction of our leaders, our pastors, and our elders clearly displayed on those walls. Identity community, and mission. That's because our leaders have been influenced by other people in this generation who have taught us, and we have all confirmed and agreed and believed that those are the foundational pillars of our faith. That if we give ourselves completely to those three arenas, we have that position of strength that firmly establishes us in our faith. Now, let's flash forward to Peter. It is interesting the similarities that in, are here in the book of Peter. First of all, before we read a scripture, let me share something with you. In the book of Peter... It is a time under the leadership of Nero 
where all of the Christians, the Gentile Christians to whom this book is written to, have been scattered abroad and dispersed over five regions. And they're being persecuted and beaten for their faith, burned at the stake. And Peter is writing this book to all of these different groups, and this letter is going to be dispersed to all of these churches that he knows exist in all of these regions. And so he starts out the book by addressing these Gentile Christians, and Peter encourages them and says, you've been saved by grace to a living hope. Thank God we're saved. Thank God we're saved. Thank God we're saved to a living hope. Our future is hope. I don't care what you're going through today. You have the right to live in hope. Jesus paid the price for your hope. Hmm. Into an inheritance that is imperishable, that hope is never going to end. Never ends. It's there tomorrow for us when we rise up. It's there when we go down in the evening. So Peter is encouraging them, but then he does something else that is amazing. He calls them something that were called the children of Israel back in the time of the exile to Babylon. He calls them the children of the dispersion. The same terminology used in the time of Daniel. So he's trying to tell these Gentile Christians, no, you're part of the kingdom. You've been dispersed just like our ancestors were. You're part of our family. And he's communicating identity to them. And he also, in this book, in this letter that he writes, calls Rome Babylon. Do we see the connection here? So here we have the same thing playing out now that was playing out hundreds of years before. Instead of Nebuchadnezzar, now it's Nero. And he is attempting to steal their identity through slavery. You're not free. You're a slave. But they knew better. He's crushing their community through the dispersion. And he's attacking their mission through, and this is key, the bondage of immorality. And Peter, what is so amazingly profound is as I read through the book of Peter over and over again to prepare for this message, I saw identity, community, mission. Over and over again, Peter pounds it over and over again, pounding it, pounding it. You, the most common scripture we quote from Peter, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, identity, a people that should show forth the excellencies of God, mission, who has called you out of darkness into his light. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Family, community, mission. Over and over again, I want to encourage you to read these books as you go home. You will, it will jump off the page at you. So in the context of their situation now, Peter is writing to the church. And he is, by the Spirit, counteracting the attacks that are being made on them. So what's his first, after he encouraged him, what's his first word of advice? It's in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. So prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all of your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed. So prepare your minds for action. I love the fact 
that Peter here in this passage uses an oriental slang word for prepare. And it paints a great picture. People from the Orient who had long, loose, flowing robes, when they got ready to go to work, they would gather, they would prepare their robes. This is where the slang came from. They would prepare their robes for work by taking them, gathering them up, tucking them in their loin belt so that their robes wouldn't get caught on anything while they were working. Peter is saying, do this with your mind. Prepare your minds. He uses the same slag. How many of you know your minds can just go and start reaching out and grabbing all kinds of stuff? Right? How many of you like me? I, I try to justify it by saying, well, I'm a scattered thinker, you know, but really that's not the truth of it. And I jokingly say from time to time I have the attention span of a gnat. Because I am just somebody who, who has to really work hard at controlling my thought processes. And as we go through this, we realize that Peter is saying the battleground is in the mind. Control yourselves. Prepare your mind for the battle that is ahead of you and the persecution that you will experience. It reminds me of that scripture in Hebrews 12.1. He says, lay every weight of sin aside. One translation says, lay every entanglement of sin aside. Sin is good at it. It doesn't have to work hard at besetting us or holding us back. If it's there, that's exactly what it's going to do. And that's why in the next few verses, Peter challenges them. Do not be conformed to the former passions in which you were in ignorance, but be holy because the God who has called you is holy. Sin will grab you when you least expect it, take you where you don't want to go and keep you longer than you want to stay. Is it okay if we talk about sin in church? This is a challenge to us. Why is Peter saying to us, get this thing in order. Prepare your mind. Take all of those entanglements in your life Pull them in. Focus on the things that are really important. And we cannot do that without this. I got ahead in my notes. Give me a minute. So how does this apply to us? You know... We looked at a couple of generations here that have a lot of persecution, and and realistically, we don't experience persecution in our generation in the United States. We really don't. Um, We might have inconveniences. People might say things that were uh, uh, are are offensive or seemingly offensive. Actually, the person I know who has actually been persecuted for their faith more than anybody I know in this country, and you might know somebody else, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but it is very rare, is my mother, who used to protest out of a conviction in the word in front of abortion clinics, and she saw many people there who were literally persecuted for their faith. And my mom has been arrested and taken into custody and charged fines for doing what she did. And she never got in anybody's way or did anything inappropriate. She was just there making a peaceful demonstration. That's my mom. She's a person of conviction. 
But in other countries, there is tyrannical rule. I was on a uh, board meeting video conference just this last week with Within Reach Global in China. And as we're talking about all of our uh, discussions and the things that we're addressing, David and Lorna, who are people that we support here at this church, were sharing a story of a man that they got to drive through China with. And as they're driving through this region, he is showing them all of the villages where he's established churches. And as they're going through, he says, and he's the guy who started the churches and he pastors those people. And they drive through one village and he says, there's a church of 20 people here. 20 people in this village have given their heart to the Lord and they love Jesus, and I meet with them on a regular basis. And here's another village, and in this village, there are 30 people that have given their heart to the Lord, and I meet with them. And as he's telling them their, these stories, David and Lorna realize that in every one of those villages, he was apprehended by the police, the military police, beaten in the streets, hauled off to jail, and beaten and tortured to get information out of him in every town that he's been in and he's established churches. And then they come up on another village. He said, I came into this village and one lady that everybody in the village, it was about 50 people, everybody knew she had been sick her whole life. God miraculously healed her and all 50 people in the village got saved. And then he was apprehended by the police, taken into custody, and beaten and tortured for his faith. And then as they drove to the next town, he said, pray with me. This is where I'm going next. I'm going to start working on this town. And David Lorna just said, aren't you afraid that you're going to be beaten again and tortured? And he said, Jesus died for me. Why wouldn't I die for him? But I believe that the grace of God resides on us because every spiritual leader I have talked to has said that our culture is moving in this direction. We have agreed, and I see heads going up and down. You know, we, uh, the, the children of Israel had Nebuchadnezzar. The early church had Nero. Now we have politics, social media, and consumerism. Those are the gods of this generation. And I believe that the grace of God is on us. I... I had, a, uh, I had the opportunity to go to China in ministry there. And we were traveling through the hill regions of southern China and visiting all of these churches that had been established through within reach. And this was back in a time when the persecution isn't nearly as bad as it is now. They've really stepped it up. They're burning churches, burning crosses, running uh, foreign missionaries out of the country right now. But before all that went down, it was still pretty bad. And we were there. And there was one guy who wanted to go on this mission trip. And I didn't know him that well. He was fairly new to the church. But he was the son of a man who was dying of cancer that was a really good friend of mine. So he wanted to go on this mission trip to China. But this guy was a self-described shipwrecked Christian. His wife had left him. His family had fallen apart. He was out of fellowship with God. He was a broken man, the shell of a man. And he wanted to go on this mission trip, and normally I wouldn't let somebody go on a mission trip like that. Right, Bob? I mean, that's, a, that's, that's kind of a scary thing. But he wanted to go because his father was dying of cancer, and his father had been six times, and he wanted to see 
what was so important to his father. So he went on that trip. He's riding on a motorcycle and had left his, uh, with a, a Chinese national missionary in the front, and he's riding on the back, and because he traded with somebody else in the van, he left his passport in the van. So when they stopped at a checkpoint, they asked for his passport, and there were two military police there with AK-47s, and when he didn't have his passport, the first thing they did was pull the Chinese national off of the motorcycle and start kicking him and beating him with the butt of their rifles and kicking him and beating him and kicking him and beating him. And he's sitting there watching this whole thing, wondering, what's going to happen to me now? And then one of the military police turned at him and said, are you on a mission trip? And the guy said, no. And he's thinking, I can lie about that. And then the guy said, are you a Christian? And this is a man with shipwrecked faith. And he said, Mark, all I could remember was Jesus said, if you deny me before man, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. And in this moment, I want you to know, that's how the word of God is an anchor to our soul. That's it right there. And he said, yes, I am a Christian. And we were all hauled in. Five hours, we were in jail, being interrogated. The grace of God is on your life to draw the line in the sand when it comes to your faith. Nero could not take it from the early Christians. Nebuchadnezzar could not take it from the children of Israel. And this world system cannot take it from you. So what does Peter say to us in application to our generation? Because we don't need a tyrannical ruler right now. We're pretty good at being led astray by our own devices. And things I never thought I would see in my lifetime have transpired in just the last 10 years. And we will be hated for our morality. We will be called bigots and cast uh, uh, all kinds of phobias will be placed on us because we just want to love Jesus with our morality, just because we've been called to be holy as he is holy. So when Peter says, prepare your minds, what does that mean for us? Well, about 10 years ago, I took up the hobby of landscape photography. When I first got into it, one of the best pieces of advice I had was a professional. I heard a professional say, the difference between an amateur and a professional is the tripod. <laughs> and realistically, there is a difference between landscape photography and action photography or portraiture. You can have a fast shutter speed. Uh, the shutter that takes a picture can open quickly and close quickly for portraiture or uh, action photography because you want that quick shutter speed to catch that nice, clear, crisp picture. But with landscape photography, the idea is to find the perfect lighting with no wind and then set your camera in such a way that you can hold open the shutter as long as you possibly can to drink in the image that you're trying to capture with as much detail as possible. And then you allow that shutter to close. 
And in doing so, that's why you see people who are able to take these pictures of a landscape and then they blow them up really big and they still look really crisp because they learned how to hold that shutter open so that the camera is able to capture and fully understand, if you will, the image that it's looking at. And then when that image is brought and put on display, you can see as much detail as possible in that image. Well, one of the key things to do that that is very important is the tripod. You can't have a cheap, flimsy tripod. You have to have this big, heavy thing that you got to lug around everywhere you go. Believe me, I know. And I've returned to the same location 30 to 40 times to get that one picture with the right lighting. But this tripod has to be firm and beefy and steady because a slight wind can make that camera move and then your picture's fuzzy. It has to be completely still. Even if I lock the mirror up, and I know you don't understand a lot of this, but even the flipping of the shutter can make a cheap tripod shake. So I have to either use a remote or do a delayed timer for 10 seconds so that the tripod is completely still before the shutter opens. It opens, it stays open, it drinks in the full image and then closes. And I believe that for the believer, if this is your brain your soul, your mind, that you are preparing for action, that it needs to be able to see things as clearly as it possibly can. And in order for it to do that, it has to be on a firm foundation that holds it steady so that it can drink in the image that it is trying to comprehend and understand. And this firm foundation is our identity, our relationship with God, our community, the people that we share meals with, that we have fellowship with, that we talk about the Word together with, fellowship that orbits around the Word of God, identity that is based on the Word of God, and a mission that comes from the Word of God. Then we have that firm foundation for our faith. How do we prepare our minds? By establishing these three pillars in our lives. One is our relationship with God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. That's an interesting statement. Love one another, another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through what? Through the living and abiding word of God. Let's bring it back again. Our identity is based on the word of God. Our relationship with God. We behold him. We are partakers of his divine nature through his exceeding great and precious promises. It is the word of God David sat on a rock watching over the sheep and said, God, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Our identity is rooted and grounded in the word of God. Next is our fellowship in the body. Again, same scripture, having purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart. This word has a similar meaning. Earnestly means to be resolute or to resolve in your heart. And that reminds me of Daniel. It said Daniel purposed in his heart he would not eat the king's food. 
He was not going to sit in fellowship with that community. He had his community in God. And now Peter is telling them here, resolve in your heart that you are going to have community, that you're going to fellowship around a dinner table with people, and that fellowship is going to orbit around God's word. I can get a little preachy on that point. I'm the community pastor. And if we could have somebody come to the piano right now. The third is our mission in the world. You know, Jesus gave us the great commission. Could you imagine that day? I mean, those apostles lived with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They slept with Jesus. And then they saw Jesus be crucified. And then he rose from the dead. And they're seeing him on this final day. All 11 were there. Could you imagine being there? Could you imagine what that would be like? And the first words Jesus says are, all authority has been given to me. Well, if all authority has been given to Jesus, then what he's about to say is the ultimate authority for all generations. And he looks out at those people and he says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. So I was on one of my morning walks recently. And I'm out there trekking along and I got my iPhone in my pocket, and I'm listening to an audio book, David Platt, Radical Together. And David Platt quotes that scripture, and he says casually, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And I've, I've heard that before, but I just felt led that, you know what, I need to pause the book, and I need to open the shutter, and I need to drink in what's being said here. So I just started walking. And I said, disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And for about a quarter mile, I just was saying that. God, what are you trying to say to me? Disciples who make disciples. And then they get together and they love Jesus. They have some fellowship. And then they make more disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And I thought to myself, if I sat here and said that long enough, disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples, I could cover and represent every generation from that day until now. Every generation who made disciples, who made disciples, who made disciples. And that tells me three things. We all have a spiritual genealogy that links us back to that day. Our spiritual ancestors stood there and listened to that great commission. And we don't need ancestry.com to figure that out. We know based on the word, this is true. And number two, we're all here right now loving Jesus 
first and foremost because of the grace of God, but also because of their faithfulness to that commission. We all get to enjoy the grace of God because of our spiritual ancestry that went before us. And we're faithful to that. And the third thing it tells me is that it's our turn now. It's our turn to prepare our minds for what this generation is going to bring. To have the word of God richly dwell within us in our identity with Christ. And then to live in community, not let one of these legs get get cockeyed and start to slope and skew our perspective but to keep all three strong keep our perspective true and sure and don't let the world steal this from you this world is a giant sucking sound and it's going to try to pull you every way it can to cloud your mind and cloud your thinking As parents and families, it's important that our kids are a priority, but I want to say something. Your kids need to hear you say no once in a while. No, we're going to go fellowship. We're going to have fellowship around the word. God's the priority in our lives. And, and you're a priority, but our, uh, our God comes first. And they need to hear you say that. They need you to model that for them. And I know that's hard because we've had absent parents that have neglected. And for us, you know, we're one extreme or the other. You know, the boat's either leaning way over here or it's leaning way over here. I'm asking you to be, to bring it up to plumb when it comes to your parenting. It's okay for your kids to see that the world does not orbit around them. It's important for your kids to see that your world orbits around Jesus. And then they're going to say, you know what? That's what my parents are doing. My world's going to orbit around Jesus too. That was for free. I didn't say that in the first service. Probably should have charged extra for that. To get this strong, don't let the world... Don't let the world take that from you. Don't let it rip you off. So as we close out, I want to ask you a question. Which one of those three arenas do you feel the Holy Spirit compelling you to consider is an, an, er is an area in your life that needs to be brought up and reestablished? so that your perspective won't be clouded by the confusion that this world is trying to infect your mind with. Which area do you need to work on? Let's just take a minute here and pray and you ask the Lord what that is. Jesus stood on that day and he proved his identity from raising from the dead. I am the son of God. And he looked out at his community and he blessed them with a mission. Go and make disciples. All three foundational pillars right there in that one scripture. That's how we prepare our minds. I'm going to pray for us today. And if you want to agree in faith with someone 
about this area that God is calling you to reestablish in your life and in your mind. You can come forward in prayer. You can tell somebody next to you, hey, would you pray with me? This is what the Holy Spirit is telling me. And you can pray with someone next to you. Father, we thank you that the Spirit and the Word agree. God, that the power of your Holy Spirit is here both to help us to will and to do of your good pleasure, God. Your will, your word, God, being fully made manifest in our lives, God, through faith. We thank you, Lord, for the challenge that you've laid out to us today to prepare our minds and to fully establish ourselves in that position of strength on your word. Help us to do that through your word and the spirit, Lord. And we bless you, God. And let's all just stand. Let's thank Jesus for his word again. That's the word of God right there. That's the word. It's got to be it. That's the anchor. The word of God. Awesome. Bless you guys. Have a good day.